do any, well, I have an item I'd like to pull from the consent calendar. Um, Nancy, I'd like to pull item too. number nine. Okay. And any other commissioners have any items they want to pull, or do I have a motion to approve absence at item number nine? I'll move to, oh, sorry. I was gonna pull item nine too, so thanks for pulling that. Motion to approve all but item nine. Second. Great, Melanie, roll call, please. Did you already look for a public comment? I'm sorry. Oh, any, any, uh, is there any public comment on this? I don't, I don't see any, has any public comment on the consent and calendar? No hands raised. Great. Then we have a motion and then a second. Any roll call call. Commissioner Zemke? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Matush? Aye. Commissioner Jane Corrale? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Lorenas? Yes. President Byron? Aye. Great. We'll move on to the discussion on item now. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to move on G up October activity reports, janitor operations and administration. These are informational only, but I'll ask for both public and committee comments. Is there any public comment on item number G? <clears throat> Don't see any hand raised. Is there any commissioner comments on item number G? Yes, I have one. Okay, Ms. Commissioner Matush. So, I've been on the commission for a long time. I've said to a number of general managers, uh, everybody's got great intentions. However, I haven't seen any concrete broken and I haven't seen any uh, shovels full of dirt moved. Well, I can say finally that that has changed under general manager Pruitt. We have a pretty fair sized construction project in addition to all the different things that we've been doing. So <clears throat> it's a sign that the Harbor District is moving forward in a positive way and getting things done under the current leadership. That's a great, great comment. Thank you. Commissioner Chang Corrali. I will uh, second that what Tom said just now. I agree. And I want to thank the staff for a lot of the great work that they've done, not just the actual work, but also in support of what the board and the general manager have um, kind of envision for the Harbor District with obviously public input, which is always important. So thanks to the staff and to the general manager. Great comments. Any further comments? Um, if not, we will move on now to item number 11. Uh, we, have, we have an update presentation on the Ricks Festival and Jim, this is your item. You're on mute. Construction in this building down below, so I stay on mute as much as possible. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, one of the co-founders and directors of the Mavericks Festival this year, uh, Chris Collier, and he is going to make a presentation on the recent Mavericks Festival uh, that took place at the harbor, which I believe was from a Harvard's perspective, it was a great success and got thousands of people to the harbor and restaurants were full uh, and people were walking all over seeing what the harbor has to offer. So with that, Chris, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Chris. It's a beautiful day out here uh, in Half Moon Bay. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Yes. Yes. Great. Um, yeah, so Jim, thank you for, for that introduction. Um, Mike and I uh, both uh, absolutely agree. Um, it was a, a fun day, uh, very well received um, by a lot of different groups there. And um, so I wanted to really do two things. One is just give a, a recap uh, uh, of what we saw during the festival, um, some things that worked, some things that uh, we, we can improve going forward. 
And then I just wanted to leave you with some ideas for next year because we have a lot of people excited and our planning has already started. So um, we just wanted to share a couple of ideas with you. So I'll take you through this presentation quickly. And um, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to interrupt at any time. So um, as Jim mentioned, we had thousands of people there. Um, we estimate attendance throughout the day from about 11 o'clock until a, a little after six. Uh, to be about 8,000 people. Um, the folks that did um, our, our stage and equipment that does festivals everywhere was saying they thought it was over 10,000, but we thought that that was an aggressive number. Um, so, so we're estimating about 8,000 people. And uh, for us, we were really focused on on three priorities. We, we wanted the different kind of groups and parts of mm -hmm. the big wave community um, to have a great time. So for us, that's the surfers, the photographers, the sponsors, the vendors, and, and the general community at large. Um, two, we wanted to have a great time without any major issues. And thanks to all the great work that Mike McLaughlin did, you know, working with the different agencies and, and Chris Tibby's team, um, I, I think it went off with any, with any major issues whatsoever. And then three, we really wanted to build a foundation for future festivals. Um, the other big highlight just from a local response was we got a, we had a great crowd, very good a, a mix of adults and kids, a um, lot of local participation. And then the people that we saw from, from out of town, we heard some, some great comments. Um, as Jim mentioned, um, excellent day for revenue for the harbor businesses. The restaurants were full. Maverick Surf Company did extremely well. Um, and um, I, I just think overall, one of the quotes that we put down there on item 2C was just people love seeing the harbor filled with people having fun and, and it was just a fantastic energy all day long. Um, the third thing was, you know, it was, a, it was a pretty low impact event. So we had a lot of volunteers that really helped us make this possible. Um, Recology did a really good job helping us um, get the harbor businesses ready uh, the morning after the festival, which I know Albert really appreciated. We prioritized his parking spots and getting them back open on Sunday morning. So, you know, he was not able to, he didn't miss any business. Um, it was the first day of the San Mateo County food and, uh, and drinkware ordinance, meaning we had to have all recyclable cups and that went off uh, very, very well. And um, none of the food or drink uh, vendors had any issues with the new ordinances. So um, because Sea Hugger was our vendor and we're all really about environmental stewardship, uh, that was great for us to see that there was no loss in kind of quality or, or attendee experience um, while being sustainable, which was great. Um, so just quickly, what, what we thought worked really well was the mix of show. We had three really fun bands, including um, Coast Tribe, which is a local band. We had uh, some of the, uh, some great surf videos. We showed a photo contest up on the big Jumbotron screen. And um, we had some excellent speakers, uh, including Sea Hugger, that, that got to plug their mission. Um, over in the corner there by the surf shop, we had uh, big wave guns displayed. It was Jeff Clark guns as an extension of the shop. Um, Bob Pearson came in from Santa Cruz and had his guns. And uh, there was a, it was really well attended by a lot of the best big wave servers in the world. And uh, it was cool just to see the local organizations um, all kind of mingling together over there. And that was um, all the guys there at the Harbor uh, and, and the team there. Um, it was Mavericks Rescue and the Coast Guard. And just to see the mingling and interaction with, with those organizations and the big wave surfers was, was fantastic. So that worked really well. Um, the exhibitors uh, had a great time. We had nine local businesses and organizations. We featured 12 photographers. Um, and then on the food and drink side, we had eight local vendors. Uh, we had good mixes for adults and children. Uh, and then even though the uh, festival was not profitable for us this year, uh, we were able to raise $7,800 for Sea Hugger uh, and give some exposure to some other great organizations that help protect our environment. Um, some of the things that we're looking to improve next year after some feedback um, just from, from people in, in different agencies. We had an opportunity to sit down with, uh, with Chris Tibby a couple weeks ago, which was great. But uh, the, the big thing was tickets. Um, we're going to have the food and vendors, food and drink vendors take tickets and payments directly next year versus actually selling tickets. And it'll avoid a step. And I think we lost a significant amount of revenue because it was a two-step process. Um, we can do bike parking better through uh, more visibility from a location standpoint and better signage. 
Uh, and then from a layout standpoint, I, I think there's some learnings we have for, for signage as well. Um, we also want to have a little bit better flow in and out. Um, there were some issues with some dogs and bikes and things like that that, that we can improve on. Um, we want to have some more healthy options for, for, for kids. Um, and then um, the last band was delayed because there was a wedding over at the, um, at Oceano. And so we had some quiet time and, and I think we lost probably five or 600 attendees uh, waiting, waiting for that band. So we wanted to be nice locally and, 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 and be good neighbors. But uh, I think getting in ahead of that would be great. Um, and then, as I mentioned, from a financial standpoint, um, we lost about $30,000. However, we invested in the right things, which was having a good blend of, of local vendors and partners and, and regional and national partners. We invested in the stage, which put Mavericks at the right scale, in our opinion. And I think we, with, some, uh, with some tweaking, we can have this be a profitable event and have the proceeds go to fund prize money for the Mavericks Awards. My last two slides here. Um, for 2023, there's three things we want to focus on, um, logistics, layout, and additions. So next year, we'd like to suggest a two-day event. It'll help us leverage our infrastructure costs uh, in, in doing it on Saturday and Sunday. We would bring in six bands, which would be three each day, and uh, we would look to close the parking lot from Friday at noon uh, until Monday at 5. But just like we did this year, we would open up that parking lot and focus on Monday morning being open early and the businesses that would be uh, there for us, the two days would also greatly benefit based on the traffic being brought there. Uh, from a layout perspective, we'd like to do the same footprint. Um, we'd like to get a little bit more space for parking and a couple other things just north of, of where the stage was uh, and, and some reserved areas, and then a little bit of space over where we had the bathrooms, um, be able to add some activation zones there just north of the Harbor, uh, the Harbor Master Office. And then some of the things that we'll add for next year would be an education zone, uh, turning that into a family zone to having some, some more family-friendly activities, adding a VIP area, uh, the athletes expressed opportunities and wanting to sign some, um, some autographs. We're gonna spread out the bathrooms a little bit. Uh, and as, as Mike said, um, better signage to, uh, to direct attendees on where things are. And then um, we also had an idea of, of highlighting the fishermen if they wanted to do something on the um, sidewalk uh, behind the Harbor Master office um, and, and and do kind of a fish market if, if there was uh, interest from the fishermen in doing that, that's something we would you know be happy to advertise and promote. So that's really the, the update and where we're going. Um, our ask of the board, and I know we probably won't get to this today, but uh, one thing we'd just like to consider um, so we can get out there and start selling sponsorships and finalize our planning would be one, approval for a two-day event, uh, September 30th and October 1st. Um, two is uh, increase the footprint slightly, which I'll show you in a second. And then three, uh, consider a, a similar uh, permit fee structure as we did last year. And then in the deck, what you'll see is um, you'll, you'll see the, the layout and um, it's very similar with the changes I mentioned. It would be bringing additional bathrooms here by the existing bathrooms. It would be expanding this area and using this for activation. And then it would be adding a VIP tent here, and then moving the bike parking up front where it's much more visible. So that was a lot. I just threw a lot at you. Um, any uh, any input or questions? Uh, uh, Commissioner, oh, comments on the presentation? I have a comment. Yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Crowley. So I attended this festival and thought it was fantastic and there was a lot of great energy the feedback was fantastic from um you know i met i saw a lot of friends there so they all loved it loved it and even um people who were not locals loved it as well so congratulations chris for a very successful inaugural event i thought it was great um, Mike McLaughlin, I think, is also here, and so I want to thank Mike. I think he did a lot of the the logistical um, work. I guess I don't know if there's another way of saying it, but you know, he was there on the ground. So thank you, thank you, and um, you know, thank Jeff, please, for us, Chris. I mean, you know, obviously Jeff 
Jeff is a tenant here and, you know, being a, kind of like a surf icon, I think it was a, just an added bonus in bringing in a lot of world-class surfers. But I think the main thing is that everyone had a great time and it was a good time to bring, to open up the harbor like that because a lot of people hadn't been there for a while or been in, a, in an area where there was like a festival kind of celebration. So kudos to you and Chris and Jeff and Mike and everyone else who made this happen and especially our staff. I know Chris Tibby, you know, did a lot and, and as well as our deputy harbor masters. And so thank you to everyone who made this a huge success for the first event. Agreed, and thank you for that, Virginia. Much, much appreciate that. And yes, Mike was amazing. He the the work with, with that that he did with the, the locals and the volunteers and and the team there on the ground at the harbor was was phenomenal. So I I love that there was just great communication and um, um, it, it worked really well. So thank you for the thank you for the kind words. Any other uh, comments from uh, from commissioners? Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, sounds like a great event, and I'm sorry I missed it. That uh, when I hear the harbor was uh, plugged with 8,000 people and parking and so on, what effect did that have on some of the businesses, for instance, like the charter boats uh, and their customers? Um, that's a great question. Um, we got some feedback from fishermen and um, Mike, I know my, Mike himself is a fisherman, has a boat there at the harbor. Um, so I know he got some comments back from the fishermen. I didn't hear anything about charter boats and it, it seemed that we were wedged in between uh, kind of a season where there wasn't a, a ton going on from a fishing perspective. Um, Mike or Chris Tibby, any any comments you guys could could add there? Yeah, I think you know uh, we were kind of wondering how the salmon season was going to run. Obviously, a sport salmon was kind of slow. Tom, I think the commercial guys were actually out fishing that week and coming back in, uh, but they were not affected per se. Talking to some of the dock sellers. Um, they said it was average. Um, they didn't say it was particularly busy or slow. Um, the only thing people were really buying off the dock was rock crab. So uh, I think that's why we took some feedback and thinking that maybe doing a, a, a more um, visible fish sale area might be something that is interesting because we were kind of hoping some people might walk down to the docks. We had the Coast Guard boats down there. People did go down there. They didn't necessarily drive fish sales. It wasn't a bad thing, but we definitely want to be conscious of that next year as well, just in case. Great. Any other commissioner comments? If yeah. not, I'll, I'll... No, I had my hand up, Nancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard. I've got to scroll. Yeah, right yeah, now. no, I know. So, so the one thing I did here, and I don't know if you want to add this in or at least consider it, Chris and Jeff and Mike, and I don't think Jeff's here, but just something that I heard was that um, it was, they were, you know, fleet and, f what is it, fish and fleet has been there and they actually promoted a lot of the local artists before. And, you know, I don't know if that's something that you want to add in, you know, so that people can, um, well, because, you know, art is a big part of the coastside culture. Right, and especially the local artists and vendors. And um, I think that that was an attractive feature for Fish and Fleet. So just a suggestion, with, you know, I love the artwork and, and, you know, supporting local small businesses, like cottage industry type of businesses. And I think that there is a network of local artists that you can tap into if you decide to go that way. So I think it's something to consider. I heard that kind of feedback, like, oh, I wish that there are some local artists here because, you know, people might want to start shopping for the holidays or whatever, right? So that's just something I heard, but it wasn't like a prevailing um, perspective. So just it's just, you know, just feedback to consider, but I don't think it's going to make or break the festival. Yeah, appreciate the feedback, Virginia. Anyone else on the board have a comment? If not, we'll move to public comment. We have one hand raised, John Ullum. Thank you, President Mearing. 
I was happy to see that um, there was a recognition that um, they needed to um, tone down a little bit the uh, adult drinking aspect of the of the con of the um, affair and provide a little bit more uh, in the way of uh, minor friendly refreshments and entertainment. So that's cool. Also, just wondering. Um, I wasn't clear, um, and I just signed in, so I didn't hear the presentation, but could it be uh, explain how much the festival cost the Harbor District, and if the Harbor District is going to recover those funds next year? And then just keep in mind um, the, uh, the recent changes to, uh, to uh, rescue operations due to uh, funding issues. And I'm just wondering if... Uh, if you guys are going to continue to subsidize this uh, festival or if you're going to um, start charging it as to pay for its expenses as it goes. Thank you. Um, any other public comment on this item? Don't think so. Oh, All excuse right. me. Uh, Thanks. Uh, Chris, could you stop sharing your screen? I think I, I made it go down, so we, we can't put two screens up at the same time. Um, I think I stopped it, but just could you double check? Yeah, I don't I, think I, I should. Okay, okay, perfect. Sorry. I I'm see sorry for the interruption. John Morins, however, I see three John Morins. Four, I see three, four. Four. Yeah. California Consulting is come, it shows up, up as John Warren. There, there's a woman who shows up as John Warren, and then there's there's a blank John Warren. And, and these are part, participants, not attendees. These are panelists. I'm guessing these people uh, took John's link to sign in. Yeah, they couldn't. They weren't able to to get on, so I had just sent them um, the representatives from California Consulting my um, link. Okay. All right. Thanks. We've got John. Michelle and. Steve Samilia. Okay. Yes, right. we're here. <laughs> All right, thank you. Well, well, thank you very much, Chris, for that presentation. It was really informative. Really appreciate, appreciate the work that all of you did on this. Um, and I'm glad to hear it was such a great, great event. Look, looking forward to next year. We're going to move on now to the ne next item um, um, on the, the uh, regular agenda, which is item number... Well, California California Consulting Grant Writing Services contract renewal and, and John Moore number one, this is your item. All right. Good afternoon, commissioners. All right. This this item is for the um, the, the for the board to consider um, uh, approving to amend the contract with California Consulting for grant writing services in calendar year 2023 at a cost of $4,160 per month plus out-of-pocket expenses for an amount not to exceed $60,000. California Consulting is the largest grant um, writing firm in California and has, been, and has been successful in writing thousands of grant applications, securing over $1.5 in funding for agencies throughout the state since their founding in 2004. They have, they have extensive experience in identifying, researching, and obtaining funding for all types of government entities. California Consulting is comprised of 26 team members and provides services to 80 public agencies across the state. Since January 2020, California Consulting has been researching, researching and applying for grant opportunities assisting with um, post award grant management, analyzing uh, the existing unfunded projects to determine the best strategies for funding, providing guidance for FEMA, public assistance funding uh, requests during the COVID pandemic and serving as a liaison between the district and state and federal agencies. They provided the district with thorough monthly grant reports that includes updates on grant application progress as well as monthly update meetings with myself, the Director of Operations. They have been able to identify and submit nine grant applications um, on behalf of the district with several agencies. Um, we've been successful um, in, um, in obtaining grants 
that total up to $525,812 for awarded grants um, and have many others in progress. We do have, as I say, Michelle Ferguson, who has been the district's contact and been the one um, leading the charge on the district's, district's behalf for California Consulting. And then we've got the CEO as well on um, mm -hmm. Steve Samillion. So I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle and Steve at present. I think Michelle will start off, got a little presentation, like to up, want to, I believe she wants to share her screen, Melanie. Yes, um, would it be okay if I do that now? Yes, yeah. Okay. Michelle will also be available. Michelle and Steve both will be able to um, answer any questions the, the board may have. Can everybody see the blue screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, thank you so much for having us come here today to speak with you and tell you a little bit about what's been going on. Um, let me see here. Okay, so a lot of what John said, California Consulting, we've been around for a long time, since 2004, and we work with a variation, federal, state, and private foundation grants, um, securing over $1.5 billion for the municipalities, school districts, universities, and nonprofits we regularly collaborate with. Out of the multitude of tasks and duties um, and services that we provide, I think three, you know, four really stand out and happen most frequently. The first is researching and developing proposals designed to champion partnering entities like San Mateo County Harbor District. Um, and so what this means is a typical proposal that's involving capacity building usually will involve at least a 10 page narrative um, detailing grantee capacity, quality, qualitative and quantitative objectives, um, cost estimates, as well as long term maintenance. Um, also analyzing existing unfunded projects where there's still a need to best determine which grant writing strategies or practices are conducive to success. Um, taking those scalable course of action that's not only informed by the current funding landscape as it's prone to changes, but ultimately place a greater emphasis on advancing capacity building and community engagement. Um, third of all, managing and overseeing post-award grant requirements through maintained interaction. Um, an example of that is with the grant we received from California Coastal um, Conservancy. So it's not just where you receive the award and then um, you write a thank you note or something like that. It's a lot more intensive. Um, usually it requires close coordination with all partners involved. So Minerva for construction, Cuesta for engineering. And this really helps to guarantee that we submit all progress reports, receipts, surveys uh, in a timely fashion, and that all deliverables listed in the work program have been achieved and submitted for clarification because that means they're likely to give again um, after the grant period is over. Um, let me move on to, oh, okay. And then here, fourth, functioning as lead liaison between San Mateo County Harbor District and state federal agencies with outgoing documentation or related reports undergoing our extensive content review and editing process prior to being distributed to any external audience. And here are some uh, grants we wanted to mention, as uh, you heard in the last slide, California Coastal Conservancy. Um, this uh, uh, amount was for $202,802. And the purpose of this is to um, help build a public restroom, including an outdoor shower area and other public amenities um, for use nearby by Surfers Beach along the California Coastal Trail. And so this is in coordination with the city of Half Moon Bay and the RV park operator. And it will make it possible to construct four stall public, a four 
stall public restroom structure, parking spaces, landscaping, EV charging stations, um, and so on. And really the overarching purpose is to make the trail something that's a greater experience for pedestrians, bicyclists, beachgoers, um, by improving day use parking area, such as making it ADA accessible or van accessible and providing those electric vehicle charging stations. Um, the second one from Metropolitan Transportation Commission is for 298,000. Uh, this was, uh, these funds will go towards expanding public coastal access and the same sort of similar thing where it's uh, funding improvements and modifications made to the day use parking area. So that includes implementation of a public restroom structure to allow for new for new facilities, ADA parking spaces, uh, and so forth. And then the third one uh, was for 15,000 with Peninsula Clean Energy. And this made it possible to install three electric vehicle charging ports inside the parking lot for anyone visiting Pillar Point Harbor. Um, and this was, you know, this was something that was purchased by San Mateo County Harbor District and then installed by a Trade Alley certified EVCS contractor. Um, so moving on, here are some grants we applied for in 2022. Sometimes it's possible that we won't hear back for six months to a year, but usually after a year has passed, it means the awarding was not made um, and you didn't get it this year. So we're still waiting back to, uh, back to hear from these places. One was, one recently submitted just last month was for the Spill Prevention and Environmental Enhancement Fund. Um, and this was for Surfers Beach to help support the restoration project, um, not only restoring the sandy beach habitat and dune resiliency, but helping um, Chris Tibbe um, and, and Brad to manage eel grass mitigation work. And this has really been important because as I'm sure you all know, there have been significantly accelerated coastal erosion rates. So anything we can do to mitigate that um, is something that's highly desirable. The second is the Boating Infrastructure Grant, otherwise known as BIG, from California Division of Boating and Waterways. This was an ask for 1.5 million. And when we submitted it, it was to ensure that facilities provided at Johnson Pier are able to accommodate larger vessels up to at least 65 feet in length, which will mean a higher volume of vessels that are visiting. Um, we did hear back from the program officer and they were interested. However, they thought that Oyster Point Marina was a more suitable location for this particular funding opportunity. So we are going to submit the same funding request in 2023, but doing this at Oyster Point Marina instead of um, at the Johnson Pier. Then, yeah, the main thing, let me interrupt just a minute, Michelle, just to make clear. Yeah. The main the main reason this big grant didn't work at Pillar Point Harbor was um, you know, in further consultation, as Michelle just, just, just um, suggested, we did, or we found out that, um, that really to have a high likelihood of success, You've got to have um, a large percentage of the um, the docks that you're building with these grant monies be available 100% of the time to transient recreational boats, and um, so that just would not be a good fit at our um, at our fishing harbor. But again, maybe a better fit for Oyster Point Marina, where we could designate um, you know some. Um, larger percentage for um, transient recreational vessels. Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you for clarifying, John. Um, the third one you see here is from California Ocean Protection Council. This is the Prop 68 grant. We asked for $794,862. And this was to address the extreme levels of coastal erosion. Um, 
which have been worsened by severe winter storms, exacerbated by climate change. And so this is really getting funding to help with dredging up the 100 thousand cubic yards of clean sand that's accumulated along the inside of Pillar Point Harbor's East Breakwater and then utilizing that sand to restore a uh, part of Surfer's Beach that's been uh, very badly eroded. So it's it's leveraging resources. Um, next, number four, this is the Emergency Coastal Resilience Fund. Uh, and we asked for two million. And the reason why is because um, we wanted to rebuild, same sort of thing, the massive devastation caused by coastal erosion, better protecting community assets, and restoring critical wildlife habitats, which is that eelgrass mitigation. Um, number five, the Boat Launching Facilities Grant from California Division of Boating and Waterways, again. Uh, this was for one million, and we asked them if they could help make improvements and enhancements to Pillar Point Harbor's launch ramp, um, while also helping to fund a public restroom replacement and new construction for a boat rinse station. Um, the same funder is next for number six, and this is for the Vessel Pump Out Station Grant, a much smaller one. We only requested 40,000, but this was to install and implement vessel pump out stations in accordance with the state's law that prohibits dumping raw sewage into the waters because we do not want to spread disease or contaminate any shellfish beds. Number seven is the Urban and Multi-Benefit Drought Relief Grant from the Department of Water Resources. This was a big one um, for 9.5 million. And this was to address drought impacts on human health and safety, while also helping to protect fish and wildlife resources, plus other public benefits like ecosystem improvements. Uh, now, currently in progress, we have the zero emission trucking trucking funding for small fleets by Bay Area Quality Management District. We intend to ask for 240,000. And this is because we currently have six four wheel drive gasoline trucks and we use these to uh, tow rescue boats, uh, helps out with Harbor Patrol. And so we would like to use this opportunity to replace two of them with EV trucks, um, one located at each facility Facility Harbor because that is uh, thinking long term and of course better for the earth and reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Um, another one, and this is a really exciting one, is the Public Works and Economic Assistance Grant, um, which is funded by the U.S. Economic Development Administration. We're asking for three million here, and we have a very good shot. And the point of this is providing the capital needed to support replacing and improving the pier at Pillar Point Harbor. And so that the facility is more modern, it can competently handle vehicles, and um, can also take larger amper amperages. And as a result of the rebuilt facility, we are estimating that 600 jobs will be created, which includes commercial fishers and many others saved. And that goes hand in hand with this particular grant, which is really focused on job creation and fostering growth. Um, number three, Again, Bay Area Quality Management District. This is the Charge Up Discretionary Grant Program. We're asking for three million. And this is to um, install charging stations again um, for the purposes of reducing both petroleum use and also air, air pollution. Um, now, upcoming grant deadlines. This is a very small little slice of what is coming up in 2023 as we head into the new year. But uh, we tried to pick out the ones that we felt were highest in priority or maybe might be of more interest to all of you here today. Um, 
One is the Zero Emission Freight and Marine Program from the California Air Resources Board. And this is for a storm reclamation program specifically for the district C lot. And so what that would involve is scrapping and replacing vehicle engines with zero emission technologies with the new stormwater capture holding a filtration area that's located underground with parking on top and lower areas being pumped through it. So that's um, a new ask that we haven't done before. Next, we have the Clean State Revolving Fund from Stormwater Resources Control Board. And this is to help fund um, with the implementation of stormwater treatment, which will facil facilitate water reclamation reclamation and distribution. Um, we also have the Habitat Enhancement Grant Program from California Wildlife Conservation. And this supports a, a spectrum of projects that can center around coastal restoration, expanding access to wildlife corridors, improvements made to fisheries. Um, do know before we submit any grant, we do call up the grant program officer and discuss with them whether they think it's a good fit. Um, once we get the get-go, then we start to, uh, you know, uh, complete the application because we want to make sure we are not wasting anyone's time as time is precious and these applications are, are quite extensive. Um, so a few other funding opportunities. We have uh, DOT's Port Infrastructure Development Grant Program, and this is to improve the safety, efficiency, reliability of the movement of goods into, out of, around, and within the port. The Jackie Spear Fund, uh, for anyone who maybe doesn't know, she is a congresswoman woman who started this fund and it is to advance infrastructure, create jobs and support the economy. So very similar to the um, EDA funding opportunity that's concentrated on fostering job growth and engaging the community more than we have in previous years. And then that's the end of the presentation, and thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Michelle, for presentation. Um, I'm going to ask the board uh, if you are you able to take the screen sharing down so that I can yes see the board. Thank you so much. Very interesting present. Um, comments from commissioners. If there's no comments at this moment, I will look look to oh Commissioner Lorenas. I have some questions, if I may. Oh yes. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the process you go through? Because many of the grants that you've listed uh -huh. require a great deal of expertise, subject expertise. So on the biological side, um, I imagine there's questions on habitat restoration and biology. And so where do you get your information from that? Do you work with our consultants? And if you work with our consultants, are they, is the funding come from us or from, from your organization? That's Same with engineering. That's a really good question because a lot of this stuff is technical and I am not the most, uh, I'm not the best expert on it. So what we do is John has provided me with a point of contact at each facility. So for example, Harbor Masters or consultants, um, a great example is with Coastal, uh, with CCC, I had to meet with the engineer and the construction organization who is in charge of that. And so what we usually do is we meet with them, we hear what we, they have to say, and then we take all that in and create a first draft. And then we have both entities look at it and we tell them, don't be shy, like make as many edits and <laughs> feedback and suggestions as you like, because that's just going to make it a better, more informed proposal. Like you'll not hurt my feelings by using the red pen. And so that feedback is so precious and 
we really, we don't reject any of it. We include it all. And then by the second time they received the draft, the second draft, then John and the different people that I was talking about who are more knowledgeable on these particular subjects, they should start to feel, okay, we are getting close to the final and this is looking good and what we want to submit. Um, sometimes if it's a really, you know, like a book of a grant, it could be three drafts. Um, but we make sure when we submit something, we want it to be every box ticked we want to make sure it is the best it can be. Um, and then we wait and hear back. And when we do hear back, and if we're awarded the monies, then John signs everything. And then it's usually a very long-term reporting requirements um, that you really have to keep on top of. It's very bad form to like, not follow up with those reporting requirements because then they will probably like never fund you again. Um, so that's that's crucial. Uh, Steve, do you have anything to add to the process? I think you said it well, Michelle. It's a collaborative effort. Uh, you know, anyone who's done grant writing, uh, you know, realizes how collaborative in nature it is. Uh, it's not done in a vacuum. You know, one person. I don't. It doesn't matter if they're an engineer or a you know, biology or oceanography professor, they don't have all the answers. Uh, it's collaborative. Uh, there's so many different elements that go into pulling together a, you know, 50 or 70 or a 100 page grant application, especially the ones that we write, because uh, as was noted in the report, we're not writing the three page or five page, you know, $5,000, uh, fill in the blank, check the boxes, send it in. You know, we're writing the large, complex, intricate, uh, grant applications. And I should mention our statewide grants manager, David Marquez, is also on from California Consulting. Hi, David. And uh, and David can certainly uh, you know attest to, to that as well. So yeah, definitely a, an intricate process with a lot of stakeholders, a lot of collaboration. And we really appreciate John. Uh, John does a, a exceptional job, stellar job of pulling everybody together and making sure all the right people are working closely to, to produce the highest quality grant application. And that's why we've, we've gotten some awards just recently and we've got some more on the horizon, so. Yeah, and to, to also um, add to that, you know, all of our projects that are pre-approved, um, we've already gone through the request for proposal process, um, you know, consistent with public contract code to bring on design engineering firms, um, such as Moffat Nickel for Johnson Pier and um, Brad Dammitz for the Surfers Beach. So Brad um, and you know everybody we've been working with um, in association with the Surfers Beach have all been um, contributing significantly. Um, you know Moffat Nickel and Brad Dammitz and his team to um, to all of the narratives and all the um, description, all scientific information that's necessary. Um, you know that we can. Um, add to support and make a greater likelihood of success for our grant applications. And each of these individuals is always so, you know, prompt about getting back to me if I have questions and we schedule a meeting so that I can learn more about, for example, eel, eel grass mitigation. I know everyone's busy and some clients will just be like, I'm too busy. And you kind of have to guess your way, but it's like, that is not the case here. They're always there to provide me with everything I need, not to mention all the attachments that are required with each grant proposal. And so, John, I also appreciate you and Kinney very much. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Commissioner Rich, you have your hand, your hand. Yes, uh, very good presentation. I enjoyed it. Uh, I tell you, I've been a little disappointed with the number of grants that we've actually landed and come through. So it must be a highly competitive uh, thing, and I appreciate the effort you're going to. Uh, do you have? Can you give us any feedback on? Uh, are you familiar with the Tiger grants? Uh, have you looked into those for us? And also, I was in Washington D.C. and <clears throat> I attended a NOAA conference where they started out saying they had billions for boat ramps, but there was uh, some uh, quirks in the way it was written. And basically, there's almost uh, no marinas, ports, harbor districts. 
or anything in California that would qualify because it's mainly electrification of uh, large freight handling facilities and the thousands of harbors and marinas and ports in California wouldn't qualify for any of that. Uh, Tom, I agree with you. I also would like to see the total award amount rise significantly. I think part of what has had to do with that is that we made a transition from the old grant writer to me in um, earlier this year. And so it was a learning process to get to know everybody and understand all of the programs, understand what each facility does and jumping right into it. But I think now that I am more well-versed with something like the big grant where, you know, we should have applied for o Oyster Point Marina instead of at Pillar Point Harbor. Mm -hmm. I think learning from that and then applying again and showing the grant officer that you really listened to them um, and heard their feedback, that is only going to increase your chances of receiving funding. So I have very high expectations for this next coming year. Um, I hope to see you in one year and say the same. I think so. Um, it is also establishing relationships with those grant officers. Um, it's really hands-on relationship. And I think John knows I'm always keeping in close contact with them so they don't forget about us. Um, with, the, with the lack of funding opportunities that you were mentioning, funding priorities change every year for each organization. So there's always going to be something. We have a database that we go through and if one opportunity, we're missing out on that this year, we try to find something to replace that. And there's so many different grants, whether it's a government grant um, uh, or a more simple type grant where we just submit you know, a, a letter with different maps and tables. I think it's important to tailor the, the proposal specifically to what that funder is asking for. Um, and, and that's the key to, to in the future, having more success with winning these grants. And so I can't tell you right now that you'll see the numbers rise, but I think by next year, you will see those numbers increase. Thank you. Hi, Michelle, um, there was a question regarding the Tiger Grant. Uh, yes, you go ahead. Yeah, the Tiger Grant is is still there, but it just be it's just renamed as Raise Grant, and um, it's essentially the same thing. Um, so it has a different acronym, different name, and we expect it to be released again next year. So if we're interested in the Raise Grant, formerly the Tiger Grant reports, we can um, look at the you know the past year's guidelines. And um, I don't think it's going to, the guidelines will change that much from this year to next year. I can't guarantee that, but we can definitely look at um, the past year's raise grant and see if there is a match, a need, a fit, and, um, you know, as, as per, you know, the process outlined by, by Michelle and, um, and John. What was that word you're saying? I'm uh, not putting it together in my head. A raise? Yes. Yes. It's R A R A I S E. Yes. Okay. Raise and and we commissioner we've written those before. Thank you for uh, bringing that issue up. It used to be called Tiger. Uh, we wrote it when it was called Tiger. It had some success and then in this last round, we wrote it when it was renamed Raise, as David said, and uh, and had some success. So we definitely uh, Michelle and our team and. David's team will really take a look at RAISE in the next iteration and see if it's applicable. RAISE is a huge application. It's probably, David, you you know, because you oversee the team, it's one of the largest federal grants that exists. Uh, but definitely we should, we should take a look at it. And also I want to agree with what the commissioner said about the competitiveness of the grants and the meeting he attended in DC, that that happens all the time. It's just these grants that we're writing for San Mateo County Harbor District, uh, John and, and Michelle and our team 
we're going after the most competitive grants, which is, which is good. That's 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 what we want. That's we we want to you know compete at a high level, and as you saw on the list, go after two million and three million dollar grants. We're we're not writing the uh, you know the simple easy uh, you know low hanging fruit. These are grants at the federal level where, as the saying goes in the grant writing world, it's like baseball. If you have a 300 batting average, you're getting one out of three. You're in the Hall of Fame. You know, you're you're an all-star. Sure. That's how grants are. Usually, grants are 20 percent uh, awarded, 18, 17, 20 percent of grant of, of grant applications are awarded, which obviously means 80 percent are not you know funded. So if you're if they receive 100 applications, they're funding 18, 19, 20 out of the 100. Um, sometimes less. We, as David can tell you, sometimes it's 10 percent. Uh, we apply for some competitive stuff, but we're happy that we just landed that that one in May, which was a also another competitive one. So hopefully we're going to see more more awards here in the next year, like Michelle alluded to. It's also very encouraging when the grant program officer contacts you and wants yeah. to talk more about it because it shows that there's interest there. There's potential. And I think what we heard with our meeting with them is um, they said, make sure you're really getting in the details, measurements, numbers, because they said the writing was very beautiful, describing the coastal trail, and that is such a beautiful part of the country. Um, but really, they want maps, diagrams, less of a narrative that's flowery and more of like detail oriented the who what where why when how and so i think when we do resubmit and we really listen to that it is the the program officer is very pleased and so <laughs> and so that is what we will try to do right great thanks thanks for those questions commissioner Hughes. commissioner commissioner Lewis, you still have your hand up Sentinel artifact. Well, thank you for your questions, Todd. They're good ones. Yeah, artifact. Okay. Great. Then I'll move on to questions from public. On oh, all, you have your hand up. Um, thanks you for take, uh, taking my uh, comments. I would have to say after this presentation that I now understand why Commissioner Matouche was questioning why we were spending $5,000 a month on this organization. It sounds like, to start with, that uh, a lot of effort was put into obtaining a grant for Pillar Point that they aren't going to fund. But instead, they should have been applying for the same grant for Oyster Point. So that seems like a year lost. I'm looking at uh, the grants that are in progress and that are awarded, and I'm really not seeing much for Johnson Pier. And as you know, Johnson Pier has tens of millions of dollars of infrastructure that is at end of life, as does Pillar Point in general. Well, Johnson Pier is the is what we're going to ask with EDA's public works um, and economic assistance grant. So that's a huge one. That's where they fund three million, and that's the one that's involved with accreting. Michelle, Michelle, you can't. We don't. We don't. We oh. can't um, respond oh. during the during their time. Oh, the, oh, 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 oh. Please, please give John Ollum some more time there, Melanie. Oh, God. Sorry about that, Mr. Ollum. No, no worries. Uh, Michelle, I wish uh, I wish that we had more consultants like you who are willing to, you know, just respond. But I would say that the $3 million that you're shooting for is not even close to the, the $14 million that was projected to be needed and is probably considerably more now. Uh, last, I uh, just wanted to point out that none of this, we would not be needing the Grand Ferry he would not be in such dire circumstances and so dependent on grant granting for your uh, operations, if not for the fact you're subsidizing operations out in South San Francisco. You really need to 
analyze how you're doing things and get your affairs in order. If you were running businesses, you'd be out of business. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments on this item? Nope. Do we have, um, let's see what we're going to do. I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion, President Ryering. Great. To approve the amendment to the contract with California Consulting for Grant Writing Services in calendar year 2023 at a cost of $4,160 per month plus out of pocket expenses for an amount not to exceed $60,000. I'll second that. Great, great. Motion and a second. Um, Melanie, call. Commissioner Matush. Aye. Commissioner Chang Crawley. Aye. Commissioner Lorenz. Yes. President Ryrie. Aye. Commissioner Zemke. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Everyone, the moon passes. Thank you, Michelle, and all for your uh, presentation today and for the work you're doing on our, our path. Thank you, commissioners. Much appreciated. Look forward to the upcoming year. Great. Uh, we're going to move on now to item number 13, shift change at the Pillarine Harbor. Through Pruitt, this, this item again. Good afternoon. Over the past several months, the district and OA3 operating engineers, Local 3, have been discussing a request by the union to go to a 12-hour shift at Pillar Point Harbor. The current shift length is 10 hours based on a three based on three separate shifts each day. In the past, using the 10 hour shift length as a basis, the deputy harbor masters would fill out the schedule and ensure at least two deputy harbor masters were on duty at all times. To accomplish this, the district was using an excessive amount of overtime. The deputy harbor masters were standing in excessive shift lengths in excess of 10 hours a day. With the recent effort to build, uh, efforts to control excessive overtime, uh, the district has significantly reduced overtime being used and resulting in some shifts now being covered by one deputy harbor master. This is not the best situation uh, as it relates to officer safety and safety of the harbor. The district staff is highly supportive of the union's requests. The change in shift length would eliminate the need for a third shift. Thus, the existing 14 deputy harbor masters will only be required to fill two shifts per day, increasing their availability to provide an increased level of service to the public to include limited search and rescue and maritime assists. The 12 hour shift length will result in a schedule in which one week will consist of three 12 hour shifts, totaling 36 hours. And the second week would be three 12 hour shifts with one eight hour shift, a totaling 44 hours for a pay period of 80 hours. The Fair Labor Standards Act provides that any hours worked in excess of 40 hours in an employee's work week is considered overtime. To comply with the act, each deputy harbor master will receive a minimum of four hours overtime per pay period or 52 hours of overtime total for each pay period. Those equal $3,414 per pay period or 88,772 annually. The recommendation of staff that the board approve the motion, which states Approve resolution number 2225 and authorize the general manager to sign the attached side letter agreement that amends the memorandum of understanding between the San Mateo County Harbor District and the operating engineers local three, changing the regular shift length to 12 hours at Pillar Point Harbor. So a normal 12 hour shift 
they will not be getting, uh, there's no overtime involved with that. Uh, and the union did come forward and say uh, they don't want any overtime with this 12 hour shift, but by law, we cannot do that if they work more than 40 hours in a week and they will. So we will be paying that overtime. But the benefit back to the district of the 12 hour shift means more deputy harbor masters per shift because uh, we are able to spread them out, uh, increase services to the public, limited search and rescue, uh, and more, more patrols and attention at the harbor and ensuring that every staff, every shift is, is um, staffed with at least two deputy harbor masters. Standing by for any questions you may have. Thank you, Jim. Jim, what's the situation with Harbor Masters? Uh, the question, I don't understand the question. How many, uh, what, how many uh, uh, hours of PTO does a Harbor Master get per month? Different, depending on the length of service they have. It's all defined in the MOU. So starting out, it would be like how much? Julie, help me out. I think it's 11 hours per pay period. No, seven hours per pay period for a new employee. I'll have to look it up. I think it's more like uh, four um, and then three for uh, extended illness bank. But um, I can look it up real quick. Okay. And that's, that's pay period, so that's every two weeks? That pay right. period, yeah. That's per pay period. Yeah. Per month. I'm kind of kind of curious so how that what we're into the whole package of benefits. Um, just just because of the fact that they did not ask ask for OM, but by law we're required to give it to them. So I'm I'm curious about that. Any commissioner questions or comments? No? I don't see any hands up. We'll move, move to the comment. John Owen. This is a side of uh, public unions that unfortunately most of us don't see. Uh, I really appreciate and impressed by the effort that the union is making to help the Harbor District address the financial situation and the mismanagement that it's in the problems that has caused is now occurring. So a real good shout out to uh, uh, district staff and to um, the union for trying their best to uh, work with this situation and provide for safety as best they can out at the harbor. Again, this whole situation is being brought on by poor fiscal management on the part of the board, poor uh, prioritization of resources, and just a total lack of professional, I don't know what the word would be, you know, you guys have just totally ignored your uh, fiduciary responsibilities. And if not for the staff forcing you to face that situation, and if not for the unions bending over backwards to cover for your mistakes, well, we wouldn't be in the situation that uh, they're hoping to create today, which is a safer situation than would have been existing otherwise. Thanks again. I really hope that uh, all of you will take the opportunity to go work a 12-hour shift with one of your union guys. I want you to go on your feet for 12 hours because I don't think any of you, maybe except for Tom, knows what it's like to work a 12-hour shift and not get a dime of overtime for it. Thank you. The answer to the um, accrual is 6.77 hours per pay period for a new hire. 
of OE3. Can you say that originally six point what? Point seven seven hours. Great, great. Um, plus they get 3.07 in EIB. Okay, great. Thanks, Julie. Um, there are longer term employees that get significantly more than that. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be looking at one today. A little later, later on. Yeah. All right. Terrific. Thanks, commissioners. Any questions, comments, comments, or do we have a motion on the item? I can make a motion. Com Commissioner Ryring, I think you missed one of the comment. Captain Smitty. Yes, Captain Smitty. Okay, good afternoon. I hope that you can hear me. Um, my name is Captain. Ooh, lost up. We have a connection. Be on mute, let Captain me, Smitty. Me, okay, am I unmuted now? I, you're good. But Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Captain William Smith Smitty. Uh, I run the vessel Riptide here, uh, CPFP. Um, my my uh, my one comment and concern over all of this is uh, is SAR and and the ability of the harbor to respond uh, to uh, um, distress calls. Um, this has been one of the major functions of this harbor over the course of years, and now it sounds like um, this is going to be cut back and limited. Um, my concern over this is that is, uh, is keeping um, the ability of the harbor to respond to emergency and crisis situations. This has always been one of the major um, um, aspects of this harbor, and I, my concern is to, to not see that cut back in any way, shape, or form. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't see their hands raised. So I think, Commissioner Zemke, you were about to make, make a motion, right? I was, yes. Great. I move that we approve resolution number 22-26, authorizing the general manager to sign a side letter agreement that amends the memorandum of understanding between the San Mateo County Harbor District and the operating engineers local three, changing the regular shift length to 12 hours at Hiller Point Harbor. Well, I'll second that. that. Commissioner Chang Changley seconded it. If there aren't any other any other comments, Melanie, roll call, please. Commissioner Chang Crawley? Aye. Commissioner Moranis? Yes. President Ryring? Aye. Commissioner Zemke? Aye. Commissioner Matouche? Aye. Great, great. This is motion carries. And thank you, Jim, for all of your work on this. And Julie, you, you too. I know that this has been um, at least a year long um, challenge. Uh, of following up on the recognition of our shortfalls and try and try and remedy them. So thank you very much. On to the next item on the agenda is item number four, the RV Park Restroom and Green Space Project. Uh, Mr. John Moore on this item, and I believe you there's a presentation. Yes, good afternoon again, commissioners. Uh, this item uh, is a motion to approve a change order to amend the ongoing Pillar Point Harbor um, RV Park restroom and green space project design engineering permitting construction support professional services agreement with Cuesta Engineering Corporation for an additional amount of $332,000 with an additional $120,750 contingency to provide additional necessary design engineering permitting grant compliance and construction support and authorize the general manager to issue additional change orders up to the contingency amount and approve an increase in capital expenditure appropriations of $452,750 to be funded by available working capital. Uh, the Cuesta team won the request for proposal bid uh, to work for the district on the design engineering construction support for the Pillar Point Harbor RV Park restroom and green, green space project. There was significant public involvement in the planning for this project, um, with, which included 
um, a significant input and um, design changes required by um, California Coastal Commission um, and um, City of Half Moon Bay, who uh, has the LCP with the California Coastal Commission. Um, and we had multiple public meetings, which, um, you know, at which time we were able to um, get um, a lot of very good input from the public, which also required some um, significant changes. The resulting final plans uh, were much more complex than were originally thought. It's no longer simply a restroom. It's a, um, it's a much larger AD, a, ADA restroom facility with outdoor showers, um, a dog drinking fountain, coastal trail reroute, um, a green space, additional ADA parking and EV, EV charging stations, um, all of which required um, significant more, significantly more um, work on behalf of our design engineering team, Cuesta, to work through all of the, the permitting challenges. Uh, the district was also able to obtain, um, as we discussed earlier with California Consulting's assistance, um, $500,000 in grant assistance from the three different um, uh, from three different grantors, all of which um, required substantial um, um, contribution from Cuesta. Um, as we discussed earlier um, in the um, California Consulting consideration, California Consulting worked very closely with our design engineering team to get all of the technical specifications put together um, for these complex, um, very complex um, grant applications, um, which did result in, um, you know, in our over $500,000 in, um, in grant award for these um, for this project, which is going to assist in the the total overall costs. Um, the project construction was originally estimated to to be in the neighborhood of eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but after the invitation for bid for actual construction, um, the project construction was awarded to the low bidder for over two point eight million. Um, that just goes to demonstrate the, the additional complexity that the, the project evolved into. Uh, as a result um, of the greater complexity and significant challenges um, working with the RV park owner and utility companies, um, et cetera, Cuesta had um, overruns, prematurely expending the $225,000 originally approved. Cuesta has now submitted the attached amendment change order um, proposal, including their itemized estimated hours required to oversee all grant requirements and um, actual construction support oversight to ensure the project is completed by the contractor um, in accordance with the tech specs. Um, Quest's proposal includes their hourly fee for all personnel and the district will only be charged for their hours actually spent on the project. Cuesta has admittedly estimated worst case scenarios, so the project will not be further delayed by shortages. The, the, project, the proposal estimates um, include uh, $202,000 for construction support, RFI submittals, review responses, um, and $40,000 for grant monitoring um, and reporting which will be all given to, all this information will be given to California consulting teams to ensure that we um, compile the necessary documents and we do in fact um, end up not violating the grant requirements. Um, for instance, we could not even yet issue a notice to, um, um, to begin, uh, to notice to proceed um, on the construction until after we had submitted a work program and other significant um, permitting challenges are, were overcome. Um, and then the grantor, the Coastal Conservancy, um, is, is now, since we've already jumped all through all those hoops, they're now prepared to issue us first our own notice to proceed. Once we get our notice to proceed from the grantor, um, then we can issue a notice to proceed to the actual contractor to start construction. So we're, we're working through all that as quickly as possible. Cuesta has, um, even though they um, 
have significantly run out of monies. Um, we are working in the, the previously um, um, approved contingency arena at present, but they've continued to, to work through these challenges. So the project has not been um, slowed at all at present. Um, we also had $40,000, um, uh, or I'm sorry, $90,000 for um, additional um, permit fee compliance and additional $120,000 that is just for a contingency. Um, and this also includes a $50,000, I don't think I mentioned it. I know it includes also, if you look at the actual proposal, it includes, um, I think it's $40,000, that it's just simply um, permit fees that they have, um, have already paid for um, on behalf of the district um, that was unanticipated and were not originally included in our, um, in the request for proposal that I prepared. Um, that Cuesta, um, Cuesta did um, bid um, um, in accordance with. Um, so the district will be provided receipts for all expenses actually incurred and will be provided detailed hourly tabulations for Cuesta staff time ultimately used. Um, further detail is provided in the attached um, documents um, and the not to exceed estimate proposal. So instead of them, um, you know, like what's, what's most common, um, where they estimate um, an, an amount for um, services to be rendered, um, they're actually now estimating an, um, an a maximum amount, which we're asking the board to consider today, but that we will only be charged what they actually provide us um, detailed um, receipts for, um, and their actual hours that their team um, members work at the different rates that I also requested they include in the proposal, um, you know, the hourly rates for each of the team members. So with, um, with that, I'll, I'm happy to answer any more questions. The staff does recommend the board approve the aforementioned motion. Thank you, John. Um, I just have a question I did read through this um, document, and I understand the per permitting um, fees, you know, the, the un unanticipated, um, but the, you know, the heading is also scope. And what, what really changed in terms of scope on this thing since it was approved? Yeah, the, originally, like I say, there was, um, um, you know, we worked closely with the city of Half Moon Bay and the city of Half Moon Bay um, um, is the one that sent us the non-compliance letter um, where we did not have a CDP, even though the, the um, project was approved by the city of Half Moon Bay's planning department years ago, decades ago, and the, um, the RV park was actually already, um, you know, been in, um, been in business for, for decades, they sent us a non-compliance letter and, um, and a lengthy, um, um, edict saying that, you know, de determining what all we had to do in order to, um, to meet their requirements in order for them to, um, to issue us the CDP on behalf of the California Coastal Commission. Um, and originally, um, it was it was just a restroom that they anticipated a total cost, the construction costs and design engineering being just eight hundred fifty thousand dollars, which um, obviously, as I said earlier, was nowhere near um, where we ended up being um, with over two million dollars just for construction. Plus, oh, I see. So it was really it was really with with really scope with regard to that permitting process. Yeah, instead of yeah, instead of just a um, a simple restroom, if you will, a prefab building restroom, we end, we're ending up with a, a much nicer facility that the yeah. public um, desired, and yeah. um, I, I believe it's going to um, to meet all the the public's expectations. Yes, yes, yes. We we knew all that. It's just that with regard to the the eat and getting the permitting. The, the coastal team did not did not follow that process. Did not understand that the this greatly increased in that cost. That that's what's causing us money. We since at the time the board made a decision on the totality project, the this has not increased. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. Quick, quick um, commissioner comments. Yeah, I guess I had a question too. Um, the amount, one hundred twenty thousand dollar contingency. That's like a thirty six percent contingency, which is a little odd, I guess. And I, I assume that's just reflecting the complexity. And I think you mentioned um, this was kind of a, a, a maximum estimate. Mm -hmm. Yes, Commissioner Zimke. Um, you know, I, um, they did add that contingency into the proposal um, in our in our discussion and in the original proposal as well before they um, revised it to a not to exceed amount as I um, as I had requested. Um, you know, and I contemplated um, leaving that off. Um, however, um, this this project is is very fluid. You know that it mm -hmm. uh, it seems we are um, continuing to run into significant challenges. Um, right now, we're having significant challenges with just access to where we can um, hook into water and sewer. Um, regretfully, um, some of the neighboring property owners um, are not. Um, it seems wanting to to be cooperative, even though we were um, we've already explained we're going to be doing a hot tap. You know, meaning that um, they would not lose their water at all. None of their guests. Uh, um, we're still working through all that, but all of these things take um, take a, all these challenges take mm -hmm. um, take up a lot of time and and significant effort, and we don't yet know what other kind of challenges we're going to going to be running into. So again, um, I, I'm asking the commission today to consider these um, this larger amount. But again, um, we can be confident that we're simply going to only be charged what they actually use. So is it our tenant that is causing these some of these long, long delays with regard to the water? No, it's not our not our tenant. Okay. Well, thank you, John. I guess uh, this just illustrates uh, how difficult it is to manage a project like this that uh, increases the complexity as you move along. So uh, I guess I just rely on the staff to try and monitor what's happening as best they can. Yeah. Yes, sir. We will do so. Okay. I'll, I'll come back, Commissioner. Comments. I see a member of the public look has his hand raised. John Allen. Allen. Okay. A little history might be uh, nice here. All of this is the result of decades of just total ineptitude on the part of the Harbor District. Uh, Mr. Nearhand has sacrificed a lot in what he's given up to allow this facility to be built, and he should be commended for it. But the truth is, is he, along with the Harbor District, have been violating the, the Coastal Commission for decades upon decades. They simply refused to obtain a CDP. And the Harbor District was aware of this and did nothing about it. Furthermore, the, the Harbor District refuses to enforce the lease that it has with your tenant, which calls for those restrooms to be open that he has on his properties that were open before he leased it, and then he closed it. And it should be noted that uh, Mr. Nehran received a really sweetheart deal. He's got that uh, property that really belongs to us, He's leased it out for 3% of revenue for 50 years. Think about that, 50 years. Those are the kinds of deals that the Harbor District was making. And uh, we don't wanna be doing that anymore. So just so you know, that's what happened. It's important that these lessons be internalized and that you all realize that the Harbor Commission and the Harbor District itself has played a huge role in this expensive now uh, fix. And that if people had done their jobs right a long time ago, 
this expense would not be foisted upon the public in any fashion, but unfortunately people did not. Captain Z, I see your, oh, you took your hand and down. Fran Pollard, I, I see your hand. Hi, I'm Fran Pollard in El Granada, and I've been watching this and waiting for this to happen for decades, like John just said. Uh, and I'm the last one that wants to see it delayed, but I'm asking if, if you haven't changed the plan, if it's still the big playground plaza that was designed and, um, and eight um, handicapped parking spaces instead of surfer parking, then I'm requesting you delay all this. Don't spend any more money on it until the public, I don't know what public meetings you've had. You keep saying that, but I haven't seen any public meetings. Granada is most affected by this. Parking is the most uh, needed element in everything we do on the coast. As you just said, 8,000 people came to the Mavericks thing. I can't even believe that. And so can you imagine the, the, that there's not enough parking? Why you, you did away with um, surfer parking and put in handicap? I've asked that before. I've, I've spoken at your meetings before. I asked, why is there eight? Why, what's the need for eight uh, handicap parking? Uh, I don't see that. And no one ever answered it. And I'm wondering why you eliminated so much surfer parking. There's only 10 parking spaces and two of them are EV, EV cars. So you, it's less than half the existing parking now. You need more parking, not less. And so I'm asked the Mid-Coast Community Council, which handles all the coast side, to, to have a presentation for somebody from the Co Harbor District come and present the plan so that the coast side can participate. I don't think anyone here has seen it. And I'm one of the few that have been paying attention to this. And... Um, and also Half Moon Bay. I know it went through the Planning Commission. There were only a few people there and they passed it and didn't go to the City Council. So they need to make a presentation there or you need- Thank you, Fran. Okay, I see any other um, members of the pub, the pub, their hands raised. Kevin Smitty briefly did, but seemed to take it down. All right, uh, commissioners, do I have comments or a motion? <clears throat> motion to approve the change order to amend the ongoing Pillar Point Harbor RV Park restroom and green space project design engineering permitting construction support professional services agreement with Quest Engineering Corporation for an additional amount of three hundred twenty-two thousand with one hundred twenty thousand seven hundred fifty dollar contingency to provide the additional necessary design engineering permitting grant compliance and construction support and authorize a general manager to issue additional change orders up to the contingency amount and approve an increase in the capital expenditure appropriations of $452,750 to be funded by available working capital. I'll second that. Commissioner Lorenis, you got your hand raised. I'm sorry, I didn't set. I do, I have a question for John, if I may. John, in the report, it says that there were, there, um, were challenges working with the RV park owner and the utility companies. Was, was that a statement saying that they were helping with the challenges or that they themselves were the challenges? I believe we worked cooperatively. However, we did have to have multiple more additional meetings than were anticipated, Ed, you know, which I guess is just not unusual as we kind of went through some negotiations, um, you know, about whether or not we could, that we were allowed to tap into um, existing electrical um, cabinets, or we had to go ahead and um, and replace and, and build all new and permit for all new, which is what we ended up having to do. Okay, so glad to hear that it was cooperative. Yep. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, 
Great, we've got a motion and as a second on the table. There's no further discussion. Um, roll call, that would be. Commissioner Lorenz? Yes. President Ryring? Aye. Commissioner Zemke? Aye. Commissioner Matouche? Aye. Commissioner Chankarali? Aye. Great, that motion carries. And we're gonna, we're gonna move on to the next item. Which is item number 15. We have informational item next on used marine flare dissolve update. Mr. John Warren presenting. This question came up last month at our board meeting. Yes, commissioners, the um, general manager and the board directed us to um, do some more research on um, the potential for us to um, assist in collection of. Um, of recreational and potentially commercial um, vessel flares, you know, that are outdated and need to be disposed of properly. So um, I've asked Chris Tibby, the harbor master at Pillar Point Harbor, who's got extensive experience with the the um, expertise in this field. He's gonna he's put together, I think, an excellent staff report, and he'll give us a briefing now. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, mute, Chris. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Ryan, Board of Commissioners. Um, as John said, this is just primarily information, and we're going to move into um, some other options, and I'll make sure you get updated through these meetings in subsequent time. Uh, uh, for a little bit of background, players expire after 42 months and must be replaced to meet the U.S. Coast Guard's carriage requirements. Simply throwing expired flares into the trash would be an environmental and health hazard as they contain highly toxic chemicals such as perchlorate. Unfortunately, there is no single agency or organization handling this disposal of unwanted expired flares in the U.S., which has resulted in the disposal of expired marine flares, as noted, not only in hazardous materials, but also explosives in challenges to marinas nationwide. As marine flares are considered considered hazardous materials and explosives. In order to even transport the expired flares, it is required to first obtain state and federal permits from California Department of Toxic Substance Control, U.S. Department of Transportation with a special permit and a U.S. EPA permit. There are also strict requirements for how they are stored, transported, and disposed of. California regulations allow individuals individuals to hold and transport or store up to 50 pounds of their own pyrotechnic flares with health and safety code section you'll see in the report. This gives boaters the ability to transport flares from the point of purchase to their home and boat and or to a licensed household hazardous waste facility for proper disposal. Haulers that collect, transport, or store pyrotechnic flares are required to be licensed for that purpose and registered by the DTSC to transport explosive waste to a permitted hazardous waste facility. If any unlicensed person accepts pyrotechnic flares for disposal, they're breaking the law. This is the main reason why harbors and marinas cannot simply accept expired flares. Historically, district staff have requested the assistance from San Mateo County Environmental Health, who have applied for Cal Recycle Grant to fund the proper and legal means to collect and dispose of the expired marine flares. In 2019, through a Cal Recycle Grant, SMC Environmental Health contracted with Clean Harbors Environmental Services to obtain all permits, procure necessary safe containment equipment, and collect used flares at district facilities on November 5th, 2019, and transport them in accordance with all state and federal laws to their facility in Colfax, Louisiana for disposal. The events that are organized through or rely on grant funding through Cal Recycle are for recreational boaters only. Commercial fishing charter vessels are unable to use these programs and their options for disposal are much more limited. Pillar Point Harbor Master Timmy, working with Coyote Point Harbor Master, contacted the California State Parks and California Coast Station Environmental Boating Program Manager at on October 4, 2022 stated the county will need to apply for a grant to gain access to Cal Recycle Plan and conduct a collection event 
with the proper federal and state permits properly and legally collect and dispose of those marine flares. The director then suggested contacting SMC Environmental Health. On October the 5th, 2022, HM Tibby contacted SMCEH hazardous material specialists requesting that another used recreational and commercial uh, event take place for both recreational and commercial mariner. SMCEH hazardous material specialists stated that they are aware of the need to have a collection event and that these are a resource intensive event and that they hope to be able to apply for and receive a cal recycle grant at present there is yet to be another stated scheduled collection date just as a little summary and to keep it all in perspective i think it's important to note that an estimated 174,000 expired pyrotechnic marine flares are generated each year by recreational vessels in california alone with the density of vessels within the san francisco bay area and in particular san mateo county there's a clear need for responsible disposal Killer Point Harbor Master Tibby and Oyster Point Harbor Master James Smith recognize the need to properly dispose of expired marine flares and believe having another countywide collection event would positively impact all San Mateo, San Mateo County Harbors, ports, and marinas. Additional dis discovery will be needed to locate funding sources and to determine the costs associated. The San Mateo County Harbor District will continue collaborative work with the DBW and applicable state agency, as well as all SMC Harbor Masters and SMC County Environmental Health Specialists, so that they may host a collection and disposal event for expired flares that serves both the recreational and the commercial mariner. Subsequent to the writing of this um, and at the direction of the general manager and the director of operations, um, we are developing a plan so that we may be doing something a little more standalone through a specialized permit process as well modeling after what was done at the port of los angeles thank you chris thank you thank you for that as a long time vessel owner i know what challenge this is and uh, it, the fact that the harvard harbor district now really looking look to perhaps uh, starting their own their own program is really good news um oh yeah, it's like this is something, something that we should follow up on regularly. Do you think like, like every three months, months or six months, you could come back uh, just and let us know it's no stand? Absolutely. I think that that would be really helpful. Um, commissioners, questions or comments on this item? item? <clears throat> Similar to President Ryring's comment about having a longtime vessel I've uh, spent the last 31 years on vessels in the harbor, and I've generated more than my fair share of flares, and I've uh, gone through amazing machinations trying to get rid of them properly. So I really appreciated the event we had uh, in 2000, I was it 19, I believe. And uh, yeah, 2019. To give you an idea of some of the details on that, a special truck had to be commissioned to drive the flares that were collected back to somewhere like New Orleans or something. It was, it was an amazing process of the licensing, some of the things that uh, Chris described. Uh, transporting these things is uh, some wild stuff. These things are aerial. Uh, they shoot off for the little shotgun shells. Well, those are classified as explosives. You have to turn those into the bomb squad. So uh, it's been a wild thing, and I'm glad we're looking at trying to help our boaters do the right thing. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, hey, Jim, I'd like to ask that this could be I won't I won't be next year but perhaps this could be on some kind of kind of a rotation um, on our agenda it's just if a surprise surprise of the issue as and we develop this program uh, again like Chris said we're looking to uh, get our own permit to receive the explosives and the hazardous materials once we receive them uh, will turn them over to a certified transporter and for disposal, uh, which will hopefully, our goal is to do it 
with grant money, which is already being used for this purpose, or some of our own money to do that, to get these things off the street. The LA program brought in, uh, I think 400 pounds of marine flares uh, and dated, and the dates of them were very old. Uh, so even they're more hazardous. So the, the answer to get these things off the street for our boaters that use Pillar Point Harbor and or uh, live in the county is we become our own uh, receiver of the flares and then give them to a legal transport. So before we do that and put it down in writing and sign any contracts or permit applications, we will have to come back to the board with very specific detailed plan on how to do this and what's required. So it will be on future board agenda of meetings. Great. Great, thanks very much. C Commissioner Lewis, you have your hand up. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, I've got a couple of comments. First, Chris, you did a great job. I know this is a, a real challenge for, for um, us and it'll continue to be a challenge. I have some suggestions. Well, first thing I'd like to point out is that these flares are easy to buy. You, you walk over, drive over to a marine store and you can buy them. And somehow or another, the manufacturer has managed to get them there. So it seems to me that we should have the manufacturers be responsible for taking back the used flares. And that's something that, that would require lobbying our, at least in California, our state officials. And so when you guys go to these meetings for um, your own businesses, Jim, when you're, when you're going to the boating waterway meetings and what have you, this would, would be something I would suggest that you work with your colleagues to try to get through as legislation in the state. And if no, nobody does it, it'll never happen, but it needs to be done. It's not our own problem, not just our problem. And another thought for everyone is, thank you for providing that giant number, Chris, because a percentage of people are going to do the right thing and hold on to them and pray that somebody will help them get rid of them. In the meantime, they're holding all these old flares, but there's another percentage of people that will just dump them in the ocean or fire them at 4th of July. So it's a, it's a, it's definitely an environmental problem too that needs to be solved. So thank you for working on it. I wish you all the best. I know it's not going to be easy and I look forward to seeing something happen so I can get rid of the flares that I have. Thanks. Thank you. Great. All right, um, so, so this is an informational item. Thank you again, um, Don and Chris, for your work on the presenting it to the board. We are Thank gonna move on, move on to item number uh, C, Killer Point Harbor Trash Compactor to Replacement. John Warren, Warren, this is your item again. Yes, commissioners, this is a uh, motion to approve the purchase of a replacement trash compactor for Pillar Point Harbor from District Vendor Superior Equipment Company, Inc. for $57,636.90 um, with informal bidding process. We wanna waive the formal bid process in this instance and to increase the capital expenditure appropriations by $57,637 to be funded by available working capital. The trash compactor at Pillar Point Harbor has outlived its useful life. Um, it's over 10 years old. Um, the internal components have significantly just worn out. Um, we're continuing to have to um, spend hundreds of dollars to, um, to try to get it um, continuing to work. Staff have tried their best to, to, um, to actually do some of the minor repairs, um, even some welding to it. It's, um, it's just, it is just um, um, completely worn out at present. The me uh, mechanical mechanisms inside um, have just all um, deteriorated over the years from the saltwater environment and all of the caustic 
um, debris, trash that um, that has that it's um, it's fed into it. Um, it's resulted in a repeated breakdown times and um, high repair costs. Um, the structural structural integrity um, has been compromised beyond repair, um, and the trash compactor is very heavily used um, every single day, especially on the weekends, holidays, and event days. Um, staff previously identified the need for replacing of this um, trash compactor, and we included it um, in the um, 2022-23 um, approved budget, board approved budget. Um, staff were able to solicit three informal bids um, and found the bid from Superior Equipment Company um, Inc. to be the best overall value for the district, which um, included the consideration of cost and their ability um, to um, actually be here in order to um, maintain and warranty the um, within a quick time frame um, in our remote location at Pillar Point Harbor. So well, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And uh, oh, this also includes um, Harbor Master Tibby was able to, um, to include the removal and um, disposal of the, um, the old Hulk. Um, so with, with that, I've got um, um, nothing more to add, uh, but um, available for questions. And the staff does recommend the board approve the aforementioned motion. Great. Any questions or do I have a motion? Motion to approve the purchase for a replacement trash compactor for Pillar Point Harbor from District Second. 100. Commissioner Lorenis, you have such good mess. You raised your hand. Thank you. Did, did you want to make a motion or? Um, I was going to make the motion and also just comment that it's amazing that that thing actually works given its state. <laughs> All right. Great. Great. I think we have a motion and a second. Um, Commissioner Lorenis or Commissioner Matouche made the motion. And Commission Crawley seconded. I'll let you all, you all duke it out. Melanie, Melanie, take your pick. Oh, please. We have public Present. comment on this item. Oh, do we have any uh, pu public comment on this item? I don't see anybody's hand up. And I don't, I don't see anybody else's hand up on the board. So, roll, roll call, any. President Ryer? Hi. Commissioner Zumke? Aye. Commissioner Matouche? Aye. Commissioner Jane Crawley? Aye. Commissioner Lorenis? Yes. Motion carries. And we're gonna we're gonna move to item number nine from closed session. And I'll hold this item as I believe there, there's a mistake date range range. Uh, it is per month, not per pay period. Is that Jim? Sorry, I just bring this on you. Jim, you're on mute. He's pulling up the item. Oh. I'm sorry, uh, President. What item were you referring to? This is um. I I pulled item. Uh, okay, so item nine. Yeah, from from consent. Um, I, because I believe there are just a mistake in the range it is per month, not per period. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Great. And are we going to discuss that that item now? Uh, if you'd like to, Commissioner Chang Crawley Crawley is nodding her head. Yeah, so just to make sure this is the item that you just pulled off of consent, right, Nancy? Yeah, this is yep. uh, this, this is item nine from closed session. In reviewing so not from closed session, from consent. I'm, from I'm consent. sorry, I'm sorry, I pulled it probably from that. In 
in reviewing uh, senior staff's uh, benefits, we came across an inconsistency in which affected uh, our accounting manager, Mr. Boomer Hawthorne. And he's done a remarkable job since his hiring in April of 2017. Since that time, he's received cost of living adjustments and pay raises, increasing his original base compensation. <coughs> Excuse me. From $112,200 to $141,419. Likewise, in his original contract, he, he earned 18 hours of PTO a month. April 18, it was increased to 20 days uh, per month. And as, as, as a manager at the district, it's my recommendation that he earn the same PTO as other senior managers. The current PTO earned by district managers is 22 hours per month. And I recommend his earned PTO be increased to 20 hours per month. There were some typos in the uh, staff report that said pay per pay period or per month. And these numbers, again, are strictly per month, not by pay period. To accomplish this, it's recommended that the board approve amendment number one to Boomer Hawthorne's employment contract. And if the board uh, wishes, I can read that out to them. Uh, but the main reason uh, I put this on the agenda and I'm putting it before the board is a purely an equity issue. We're not giving him a pay raise right now. This is simply uh, an amendment to change his PTO uh, from 20 hours a month to 22 hours a month. Standing by for any questions you may have. Okay, uh, just Great, a quick. Thanks, Jim. Com Commissioner Charlie, you have your hand raised. Yeah, just a quick clarification. I just you just said it at the last at the end. Is it? 18 to 22 or 20 to 22 and it's a total of 22 and not 20 correct because you had mentioned 20. <laughs> yeah, to 20 and in the report it says from 18 per month to 22 so I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page that he's getting 18 hours per month and you want to change that to 22 hours and not 20. No. His hours. original contract, Commissioner Corrali, was 18 hours of PTO, PTO a month. In yes. 2018, this PTO amount was increased to 20 days per month. Okay. That, I, so I didn't as of today, that. he's earning 20 hours, not 20 days, 20 hours per month. Um, and what I'm recommending is we change, add two more. So he's be moving from 20 hours a month to 22 hours a month yeah okay so i okay i get that so i didn't see the 20 hours here in your staff report yeah that, that was a typo that was there. the typo okay so i'll make a motion to amend the employment agreement with boomer henthorn the accounting manager and authorize the general manager to execute um this amended agreement to move his uh boomers PTO from 20 hours per month to 22 hours per month. I haven't asked to ask public comment yet, so I'm going to oh, sorry, Nancy. motion I'm... and see if anyone has public comment on this matter. I don't, I don't see hand raised, so I'm going to come back to the panelists. Commissioners, we have a motion on the table, and I need a second. I'll second that. Thank you, Commissioner Zemke. <clears throat> if other questions, call, please. Commissioner Zemke? Aye. Commissioner Matush? Aye. Commissioner Chang Grawley? Aye. Commissioner Lorenis? Yes. President Ryering? Aye. The motion carries. Thank, thank you. Um, we're going to move on now to item number 17 appointment, appointment of labor negotiator for negotiations with general manager. And, um, this is going to start with my appointing. Labor and labor negotiators. I'm going to appoint myself and Commissioner Chen Crawley as labor negotiators to work with our manager James Pruitt over the next few weeks, and then we'll come back back in December and present our recommendation to the board. 
Um, and so, so right now we will be moving um, into session for public employee performance evaluation. I should like everybody should have a link for this. Uh, I should also have an email from Trisha. If you could get that email, email open when you move it into closed session, that would be, be great. So Nancy, there's a public comment on this item. I would take that now. Uh, John, John, you have a comment. Well, I was going to thank you for um, moving closed sessions to the end of the meeting so it would make it convenient for the public to hear commissioner comments and future agenda items. I had to step out of the, the room for a moment. I got a job. But um, did I miss it all? Did I mean, did, did you go through future agenda items and activity reports? Or did uh, President Rearing just decide to change the agenda uh, capriciously. Thank you. So I'll see you all in, in closed session. So just to Recording make sure we're stopped. leaving this meeting, correct? Yes, and, and I the just second link. I just resent um, the new link about 15 minutes ago. Yeah, no, I have it. I just want oh, okay. to make sure we're leaving this okay. meeting. Thanks. Mm Look at the flare. There. Okay, great. So, so um, the, the meeting is back in session and coming out of, out of close and we have no, nothing to report. And we are now at item, item of E, commission comments. Do any commissioners have comments they have to make this evening? Uh, yeah, I would just like to make a comment that I unfortunately will not be able to attend the next uh, meeting in December. Oh. All right, thank you, thank you, miss you. Mr. Yeah, I have a quick question for Jim. So are we going to be participating in the Night of Lights Parade? Is that December 2nd? 
of like right now, we're planning, we're planning on it. Okay. And then the other thing is I've heard from uh, members of the public that they would love to see that lighted boat contest back. So on board at some point. We received multiple emails uh, on that topic and wanting the lighted uh, festival to come back. But uh, just planning for that festival is very, very difficult, uh, especially when the person who's been running it for decades no longer works for the district. So we have to start from scratch and the personnel and the extra overtime we need to put in for that. So we, right now the plan is to bring it back uh, in next year, but nothing prevents a boat owner from right now from decorating their boat as they see fit. We're just not gonna sponsor it this year. Thank you, Jim. Jim, Commissioner Ness, you've got your hand up. Yes, I do. Um, I'd like to just point out yet again that having the commissioner comments at the end of the meeting is, is not conducive to communication with the public. And then rearranging the agenda and putting our closed session in between these comments, again, does the same thing. And I'm flabbergasted that you do this. And I would like to know why. All it does is give us a bad name. Commissioner Lorenis, I couldn't just disagree with you more. And it is the prerogative of the president to rearrange, rearrange. And today I, I did it because I wanted to put the appointment of labor negotiator <laughs> with, with the public employee uh, performance evaluation. I think there was no harm, harm done. But thank you for your, com your comment. I think the public would disagree with you. Well, I know I know one would. And when one minute call next, Commissioner John, uh, the, the, yeah, ex Commissioner John Owen, you have a comment. Nancy Rearing, what is the point of having an agenda if you can arbitrarily change it without even telling people you're going to do so? I mean, I can understand. I've seen this happen where board presidents at the beginning of meetings will state how they're going to. Mohi, can you start the time again? That was me. I'm told. I'm sorry, John. Oh my God. John, go ahead. Sorry, I was just trying to lower your hand, and I pushed the wrong button. No, I, uh, I appreciate it, Melanie. But I can tell that uh, Miss Jane Corrali, with her "Oh my God" comment, is either upset with you or upset with the fact that there's public participation. <laughs> And none of them, she doesn't care. And Ms. Rearing, I don't understand what your attitude is. If you want to change the agenda, yes, you have that prerogative. <clears throat> but most people would consider civil and just downright polite and good manners if you would explain you're changing the agenda before you just arbitrarily change it. I believe this was a Brown Act violation. I'm sure Ms. Ortiz will explain desperately why it wasn't a Brown Act violation, why the agenda means absolutely nothing, and that you can do whatever you want. But Ms. Chain Corrali and Ms. Nancy Rearing, this isn't the way to run a democracy. This isn't Donald Trump. This isn't the way we do things in America. We don't treat people like this just because you don't like them. We don't change the order of things just to make it inconvenient for people to participate. I don't know who you think you are, Miss Mary, but you ain't that person. You ain't that even close to that person. You are just a public servant who was elected to do a job and you've done it horribly and you continue to arrogantly act this way and embarrass your staff and embarrass your whole organization 
because you simply cannot stick to an agenda. You simply cannot pay attention to what is going on during the meeting. You constantly need to be reminded that people are trying to participate. What is your problem, lady? Thank you. Uh, All right, Commissioner Chang Holly. So um, I was concerned about the technology issue, Matthew. which is my, which is the reason I made the comment because we've been dealing with uh, Zoom meetings for the last two years. So I hope that if we have to continue this, that we get more of the bugs out of our system. And I do want to thank you, Nancy, for you know doing your great job as president, and um, you know. Part of being a leader is to take the shot of of people who don't agree with you. And it is your prerogative to change the order of the agenda so that uh, we can run efficient meetings. And I think um, that's what you've done. Other other agendas that I've seen have commissioner, you know, elected officials comments at the end of the agenda. So I don't think there's anything strange about that. So thanks for your leadership, Nancy. And is, Jim, is there any way that we can make sure that we don't have these technological glitches so that the public just doesn't assume that we're going after them when we're not? Yes, we're actively working on improving our system. Uh, I know, we've, we've had, had two years to do that, to deal with this, yeah. uh, actually over two years. And we're, we're still having these issues of, you know, not getting the clock done right and, and so I, I, I I'm hoping that we'll go back to in-person meetings soon but we, we just shouldn't even you know have these types of glitches anymore after dealing with zoom meetings for the last two plus well two years that was my oh my god comment just so that the public understands that Thanks, Virginia. I think I think we've done a pretty pretty good. It is a challenge, and when you sit through of these Zoom meetings at any agency or, or municipality, you see everybody the same kind of struggle. We're in this together, so we just do the best, do the best that we can muddle along. Um, I see a member of the public has his hand, his hand raised, and Captain Smitty, you're on. All right, let me try. So, am I unmuted? Hello? Yeah, I'm out there. Okay. All right. Um, first off, uh, I want to uh, talk about the technology of this. Um, it's a love-hate relationship with this. I applaud uh, you for continuing with uh, the, the Zoom meeting for, uh, format. Uh, it allows people like me that are just a working slob trying to get through my day uh, to still participate, even though it's minimally and uh, I, under, I understand that the technology, yes, we've had several years to work on the bugs on this, but it invariably they do updates to different systems there, and um, there's, there's always glitches. I was at a PFMC meeting, and they had the same kind of issues. I appreciate that you keep this format. I look forward to the future to being able to participate in this format. And uh, I just wanted to say that thank you very much for continuing it. Thank you, Kevin Smith. Your point is well taken. I, I do a lot of, um, I see a lot of movement toward hybrid uh, meetings. And I think that that's really a great idea. And even for those of us on commission who may be coming from you know, locations not on the coast, um, I do I do remember the one year um, that I was was commuting to for for meetings that were in person. Um, it was traffic sometimes unbelievable. I had to allow allow an hour and a half to get the meetings and getting stuck. You could still still be in your car and have your phone on and at least try to participate in the meeting going forward. Um, Commissioner Chang, Carly, Carly, you're just up. Yeah, thank you. So I just want to say that the HR committee me, um, met and we did do a hybrid. So I'm not suggesting that we're not going to, that we're going to go back to an old way to, to um, disallow public participation. I think, in fact, we're trying to expand it with the hybrid meeting. So 
I guess I just want to get the glitches out because we had so many of them at the HR committee. It was our first meeting that was a hybrid meeting in person and, um, you know, online. And, you know, thank you to Melanie and Julie and the staff for, you know, making that work. It was not easy, but I just just want us to get the meetings, the, the technology um, glitches resolved so that the public doesn't have to be inconvenienced. But I mean, thank you for doing this, but we're, it looks like we're gonna be continuing with the hybrid meetings because we have the system set up. So uh, for those who are concerned that, you know, they're gonna have to come into every meeting, that's not necessarily true. We're, we had the hybrid meeting for the HR committee um, meeting, and I think that we're gonna continue with that. That's great. I mean, I mean, in terms of inconvenience, nothing's more inconvenient than having to drive an hour or more over the hill. Those of us who don't live on the coast, being able to participate in a, in a river district meeting for the rest of the county, other than the coast, it, it fantastic to have Zoom. So um, we have one, unless there any, any other comments, we have one item left on the agenda. And that if is- If I may, President Ryring? Yeah. I just want to let you know that, and Commissioner Corrali, that I am in the, the boardroom using the new Zoom room technology. So we put a lot of work into it and it's working fine now. There were some glitches in the software that we had to fix and that's been fixed. So uh, the system will be, is up and running and can take hybrid meetings at any time. That's great. Well, I have very confident sentence in your staff. Uh, the last item on our agenda is um, future agenda items. I item number F. Any commissioner items that to put on the future agenda? I see hand raised in the public column. Just make it clear. Just want to make it clear to the staff that I understand the difference between a technological problem caused by Zoom and the platform itself and mistakes made by staff. Generally speaking, very few mistakes have been made by staff and the oh my God comments about somebody just asking to restart a clock seems way over the top. And the implied criticism of Melanie and the rest of the staff over that is just bogus. Everybody's been putting up with this, um, Ms. Corrali. It's difficult, Zoom meetings, I agree. But I see the same kind of glitches occur at, at the private company meetings where thousands and thousands and millions of dollars in contracts are on the line. So this is not a problem with staff. This is a problem with Zoom. And that's just the way it is. And you're just gonna have to accept that, Ms. Corrali, that sometimes the internet gets overloaded. Sometimes it just doesn't work. The whole meeting, we've been listening to an echo on Ms. Raring's phone and nobody's cared to do anything about it. Ms. Raring simply would just need to sign off and sign back on again. She's not in good. So let's just keep it clear. Staff has done a great job over these last two years. These meetings are incredibly difficult to put together over Zoom. And for you to comment in the way you have, Ms. Corrali, and to call out the Lord himself over a simple mistake over starting a two-minute timer is simply ridiculous and very indicative of the kind of person you are. Thank you. So we are back um, and looking at any future agenda items. If there isn't anything, I will enter a motion to adjourn, adjourn our November meeting. Motion to adjourn. Second. Roll call, Mel Melanie. Commissioner Lorenis. Yes. Commissioner Jane Crawley. Aye. Commissioner Matush. Aye. Commissioner Zemke. Aye. President Ryring. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good mid month. See you in December. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank Happy you. Thanksgiving.